reading this morning is from John 13, 1 through 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Thank you, Mark. If you'll bow with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that uh, we do have the freedom to come and worship you, that we do have your word to guide us, that we're not restricted for it. We don't have to hide it. We can openly display it on our uh, tables and everything else, Lord. But help us to not just display it on our tables, but to read it and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Open our ears, Lord, to hear you. Open our hearts to have you write your words upon them. And Lord, just dwell with us with your spirit so that we worship you in spirit and truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week was kind of um, the Dahlbergs, the Reeves, the Hensons, a few Laidleys, and a bunch of fields. A lot of you guys weren't here, and that's okay. I'm not pointing fingers or anything. But I had a message prepared for last week that I didn't give. Instead, we talked about Santa Claus. But you'd have to know the context of that to know what we talked about. Because we talked about why Jesus is so much better than Santa Claus and going out there and telling the world that. So anyway, this week I am going to give you the sermon that I was going to give you last week. So it's been a while since I did it. So if I stumble on it, you know. But hey, the words are all there. We read... John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then we read 18, 19, 20, right? Whatever it is, 21, I guess, 21 chapters. And then, yes, Rose, I had you read on the last day, 1 John chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2 John, and 3 John. You had seven chapters to read, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. How many of you eaten today? Raise your hands. Raise this is hands. How many of you are gonna eat today? Raise your hands. Eat. Anybody gonna eat? Right. How many of you plan to eat tomorrow? And the next day? And the next day? Well, I'm doing this just for a point. This morning I got up and I ate some Fruit Loops with marshmallows in it. They're divine. When they put added marshmallows to the Fruit Loops, it was like they already made something good, even better. But I didn't want to bring over my open Fruit Loops. Yes, it's good. You've got to try it. Don't snicker. I brought over a box of uh, Frosted Flakes over here. Just to give you an example. I don't know if you see what my phone is flashing. Of course, now it's going to go blank on me. 11 minutes and 14 seconds. By the time I grabbed my bowl out of the, the cupboard, poured my... Um, fruit Loops with marshmallows in it, poured my milk in, put the milk back up, ate my Fruit Loops, washed my bowl, put it up, and fixed my cup of coffee. It was 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Okay? Now, most of the time that you eat, it takes more time to prepare for that, more time to eat than that, and more time to clean up with that. I use cereal because it's a, about as easy an example as you can get, and if you ate just cereal, you would survive. But without eating cereal, without eating something, your physical body will die. What about your spiritual body? And today is January 1st. If you make any New Year's resolutions, anything else, feed your spiritual body. As the scripture said, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me, that training to godliness has good benefits in this world and in the world to come. You wouldn't go without, none of you said you were going to go without food today or tomorrow or the next day. But if we don't discipline ourselves, so many times we go without God's word to guide us to be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Because we say we're too busy. 
Now, it just happens that it fell that way that I had to put all of 1 John in there. And I did have a purpose in putting John last afterwards because John probably is the one writing these last letters. He is the last apostle alive, and he writes this letter to the church, this gospel, this good news about Jesus coming in the flesh, being the light, being the word that's dwelling among us. And his gospel is so different than the other gospels, and it's mentioned so much about believing, 100 times roughly, and so much about loving, 50 times roughly. So that if you believe, you have to be a disciple of love. If you're not having love in your life, then number one, you're not reading enough to see that God is love, and without God's love in you, you wouldn't even know how to love, and that you can't be His child if you're not expressing love. And that points back to the fact that maybe you're not even His child if you don't understand that. So are you filling yourself, feeding yourself, and is it showing through you? Are you living a life of love? So the, we do have a reading plan for this year, and I'll explain it to you a little bit more. And guess what? It requires a little more commitment than five minutes. Last year's commitment was five minutes, five days a week, um, and then you reflect on it. This one's going to be a little more reading, Chuck. But first I want to go through John chapters 12, or chapters 13 through 21. I'm not going to go through the letters of uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John yet. Merry Christmas. That's what we say instead of Happy Holidays, right? right? And we say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Christmas, don't we? Because Merry is a word that we associate more, and I'm glad this isn't a word that Satan has destroyed because so many words Satan has destroyed and we don't understand them. And we say a Snickers bar is awesome. No, God is the only one who is awesome that we should stand in awe of and, and literally fall down on our, our knees and lay out uh, flat on the ground because of His awe and His love for us. But Mary is a state of, I am Mary, I am jolly. It's more than happy. It's a way of life. So I say that simply because I was going to say it last week to start you off with what is your life saying? More than just saying, and you can say what, the gospel, preach the gospel and shine your light every day. You don't have to do it just during the Christmas season, of course. But your life should be merry, not just happy, not just content, not just at peace, but merry so that you want to tell everybody about the good news of Jesus Christ and what He's done for you. Because once you were blind, but now you see. Once you were lost, but now you were found. Once you were dead, but now you're alive. So in John chapter 12... Jesus told His disciples that He was going to die, but He also told them that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there cannot be a harvest. He's also talking about them because they're training up to follow in His footsteps, to be His disciples, to carry on what He has started and continue that from disciple to disciple to generation to generation until He returns and claims His church for His very own. And if you remember, he's just come off of chapter 11 where Lazarus was risen from the dead. And in chapter 12, there's a festival giving in his honor and Lazarus is there also. And the people have come to see Lazarus just as much as they've come to see Jesus because of Lazarus' testimony. He was dead, but now he's alive. Let's go see this guy and let him tell us about what Jesus did for him. So then we get to chapter 13. Well, at the end of chapter 12, we notice, too, that there's a difference between darkness and light. We've already seen it in God, John's gospel, and we see Nicodemus mentioned again. Will he be willing to come out of the darkness and into the light? Or is he afraid that his deeds will be exposed and he loves the darkness more than the light? We'll see as we continue to read. Chapter 13, Jesus talks about love, and I entitled this Jesus' Example of Love, and Mark read the scriptures from the first part of chapter 13. Chapter 14, Jesus describes what people are like that do love. He says that His disciples will be known by the way that they love one another. And if you love Me, you obey My commandments. Chapter 15, we get into the cost of this kind of love. This great love that you have, that you would lay down your life for your friends. Chapter 16, the cost will be worth it though. It will cost you something, but it will be worth it. Chapter 17, Jesus even intercedes with prayers, and His prayers are not just for, for the disciples, but for everyone who believes. 
So we have all of this discourse, and maybe you want to read it again, all this teaching where Jesus has gone from the public to the private in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So these are chapters that you should read and you should study, and as you see the words that are dominated in these chapters, it's not believe, it's love. Because we've already reached the point where we have proclaimed that we believe and we've gone into the upper room, into the private area with Jesus and He's teaching us not about believing but about loving and showing our love for each other. And we see that coming to culmination on the cross in the next coming chapters. Chapter 18, though, Judas betrays, Jesus is, ex is accused, Peter denies, and Pilate fears. But he won't come out of the light, out of the darkness into the light, will he? So he washes his hands clean. Well, guess what? You don't wash your hands clean of your sins. Only Jesus will wash you clean of your sins. You can't deny your sins. You can't take your life to proclaim it. You've got to do like Peter does, and you've, you've got to repent and turn back to God. Chapter 19, the soldiers beat and mock Jesus. The crowds rage, but Jesus is still silent. And remember back to chapter, chapter 3, Jesus said, The Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. We see this coming to culmination in John's Gospel so that you will believe and that you will become a disciple of love just as He is known at this time. Jesus dies in chapter 19. His death is verified and He is buried. But it's not the end of the story. We've got a couple more chapters, don't we? And guess who we see again in our reading at this point? We see Nicodemus. Don't, don't miss these points because this is a story of one man and, it, and more than likely as a Christian, it's your story. Because you fear coming out of, the light, out of the darkness and into the light. It's natural because we are sinners. I remember growing up, I grew up in a Christian school and I had the, oh, that's a terrible word to say, opportunity to go to public school. And I thought, well, you know, That'll be good, but if I go there, because they got all these sports and programs and more people, so I can, I can meet more girls. <laughs> but I sure can't tell them about Jesus there. They would ridicule me and everything. Well, I did, and I stayed at a Christian school because that was God's plan, and I'm glad that it is because he, he wrote those words in my heart, and they're there today. But so many times we fight that spiritual battle of whether we're going to stay in the darkness or come into the light or if there's a little bit of darkness that we haven't let the light overcome when the light overcomes the darkness there is no darkness at all you've got to decide if you're going to let the light fully fill fill you fill you completely and we see this about Nicodemus. He knows the truth, but he's afraid of what it'll do, because what it might cost him. The disciples are the examples. They've already given up everything to follow Jesus. And we saw in John chapter 6 that crowds followed after Jesus, but they only wanted the physical. They only wanted bread, bread, frosted flakes, fruit loops, whatever to feed their body so that they could go on and do the things they wanted to do. Because they were more concerned they wouldn't skip a meal, that's for sure but they weren't really concerned about feeding their spiritual life. I know a lot of you don't have 30, let's see, 11, 5, 4, 33 minutes and 42 seconds if you had three meals a day <laughs> to read God's Word. Or maybe you're already doing it so you don't have another however many. But like I said, the example of cereal that I gave you is the most easy example. If you really sit down and look at the amount of time you spend going to the grocery store, planting your garden, harvesting your garden, putting your goods up when you get back from the pantry, pulling them out to prepare the food, looking at a, a uh, recipe for what you're going to cook, the cooking, the eating, the cleaning up. How much time do you spend feeding your physical body? How much time do you spend feeding your soul? I try to sit there and read God's Word and study and pray for the amount of time that I feed my physical body. And most every day I fall short of that amount of time. I try to look at God's Word like I look at cooking. I've got a wife that cooks well. <laughs> and whenever she cooks up and I come home, I smell it and I'm like, mmm, wonder what we're having for dinner tonight. I try to go to God's Word and to, to, to His throne room the exact same way but more 
There's no comparison. The God of all who creation who desired to create me, to knit me in my mother's womb, that has a plan for me to prosper, to thrive, and a plan to spend eternity with Him because my sin debt has been paid completely and I have been made white as snow because of my faith in Jesus Christ. How can I not love in return and give my life as a disciple of love? That's why we read John then and read his, God, his letters as well. And as you read First John, you see, see that more and more. He mentions love again repeatedly, repeatedly. Chapter 20, the resurrection, an empty tomb, a time not to weep or to mourn, but instead to rejoice and to tell others, Jesus Christ is risen. But also don't miss the point that Jesus says, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. That means there's time to be work to be done. Don't misunderstand what that means. That means don't cling to me. Don't take time to hold on to me in the flesh, to worry about things in the flesh. But you've got a job to do and tell others about the forgiveness of sin because the Messiah has come, the Son of God, the Anointed One, the One who will save His people from their sins. And you have to continue this work. You have to believe and you have to live like light in this world if you're going to be a child of light. Then we've got to chapter 21. And you have the example there of, of Peter. Uh, oh, and in chapter 20 first, let me finish that. John tells us about the purpose of writing his book at the end of the chapter. Verse 30 Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So if you believe the chapter could have finished there and everything, this is the, this is the reason that John wrote this, but chapter 21 says go and do it. Even though you'll make many excuses, you say, but Lord, I denied you. I denied you three times you don't have any excuse. And you look at physical feeding again so that you can understand spiritual feeding again. Don't miss the point. The point is that you are called to be a fisher of men. Even though that's not in this gospel, those exact words, the point is there. You are to go out and tell the world you're supposed to feed his sheep, to tend them, to, them, to, to care for them, Three times Jesus asked Peter if he loves him. And if he loves him, that requires a response by Peter. Three times Jesus says, feed my sheep. If you study God's Word, and you should study it besides just reading it, there's where we have the preparation and the cooking time and the cleaning up and all that that takes even more than just the consuming. You'll understand that there's a couple words used here. The first and third occurrence, is you, the word is used, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. You can go to Walt later and ask him because I'm sure he knows. The word means to feed animals. But the second occurrence in between doesn't mean just to feed them because a shepherd doesn't just feed them each time, but he tends to them. He nurses their wounds. He takes care of them. He consoles them. And he carries them on their neck if one's lost. Whatever things that he does, he loves and cares for his sheep. So the second word that is there means just as much feeding, but it means tending to the flock. And don't get caught on the fact that this is just for believers because this is talking about everyone, but even more brotherly love. And as you read John's letters, you'll discover that. To feed the good news and then to tend to those who enter into the gate and find eternal life. And then Jesus will return and gather His flock and He will separate the sheep from the goat. And no man knows that time, so we ought to be living each and every day as if it were occurring tomorrow. Or today, even better. Hmm. How am I living then? Am I feeding the sheep? Are you feeding the sheep? You don't know who the sheep is. Again, there may be goats that you're feeding. You don't have any idea. But you proclaiming the Word will feed and hopefully bring them into the fold, and then it's Jesus' job to discern which ones are His. You're to go out and proclaim, and if people say they believe, then you're to tend to them, disciple them, train them up, so that they will do the same. 
And along the way, there will be some Judases. But that's not your problem. Your problem is to proclaim. Your problem, not problem, <laughs> your privilege is to proclaim, to live a life of light, to be God's child on this earth so that you can be like Jesus in this earth until He returns. That you have left all, you have forsaken all, you have come to follow after Jesus. Dute o piso mu. I can do that one pretty good because I remember it. Come and follow me. Deny everything else and come and follow after me because the world doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is me following after Jesus and he has given me this example of love by laying down his life for me. But that takes me back to John chapter 13. Okay? Did you miss John chapter 13 and all that? But let me read you what Mark read again. It was now just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was underway, and the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had delivered all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the supper laid aside his outer garments and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with a the towel that was around him. I'll use a loyal thing. Wow! Does that sound kind of like it? <laughs> that should blow you away. Jesus has just come off of his personal, I mean his public ministry, preaching to everyone the signs that he's done so that they might believe, a uh, party in his honor, a festival in his honor, Lazarus there, and then he takes his disciples into the upper room, and he knows that he is leaving, that it is his last night here alive. This is his final training. Now, we do have some training after his resurrection to the ascension, but this is before he gives this passion of dying on the cross. He said, we got one more night to spend together. And this is what he does. He washes their feet. Wow. Okay, I'm going to go back again. John's wrote his gospel way after the other disciples. He's probably the last one alive. He is known as a disciple of love. He is fathering the church that is there that has been persecuted severely. We don't know exactly what year this is or anything else, but they may have seen their brothers and sisters being, well, they have seen their brothers and sisters being crucified. Even John thought he was going to walk through this life with his brother by his side, and his brother dies by the sword right off the bat. And he is training up the church. He is the last of the twelve. And he refers so many times to my dear little children. And he's teaching on this. If you believe, look what Jesus did before he went to the cross and died. He gave you this example to love one another by taking on this task that no one would want to do. It's way beneath me to have to do this. No way, no how am I going to get down and wash the nasty feet. But that's what Jesus said that He's called you to do. And because you live this way, people will know that you're my disciples. And if I don't die, if a seed doesn't fall to the ground, there can't be a, a crop produced. Oh yeah, and those words that are ringing in my ear, come follow after me and I will make you fishers of men. If I am relying on my own might, if I think of myself more than I am, if I can't get off of my throne to put Jesus on the throne, how am I ever going to live like Jesus who humbled himself, gave up heaven, and did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his advantage? but instead went like a sheep silently before those who accused him, the whole world raging out of him, if you're the Son of God, come off that cross and save us too. But since he was the Son of God and he loved you so much, he kept his mouth shut and died for you. He gave up his life to save yours. And you can't take a menial job like washing someone else's feet because it's beneath you because you don't want to do it or you're not equipped or someone else does the job. Any job that the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do, you should do, period.
There are no excuses, and there's nothing like Peter saying, I can't do it, Lord. You've been reinstated. Feed my sheep. Feed and tend to them. Feed my sheep. If you love me, you will do these things. Also remember, there's been seven signs given. The seven signs are the changing of water into wine because the festival will continue on. Jesus Christ is here. The healing of the royal officer's son, the healing of a paralyzed man at the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on water. And if you don't believe all these miracles, there's a healing of the man born, born blind. Scripture has never recorded anything like this. No one has ever heard of anything like this, of someone being born blind and now can see. And in, to top that off, Lazarus is walking among you. There have been five I am statements out of seven. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. And if you are thinking ahead, you know there are two more I am statements in these upcoming chapters. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. See the progression of where John's gospel is going? Do you believe these signs? Will you be his disciple? Oh, will you be a disciple of love in this world so that others can find their way to an eternity? So if I'm not a disciple of, of love in this world, then I guess people won't know me that way. Well, they, they won't know that I'm Jesus' disciple, so I guess they'll know that I'm a hypocrite. And I guess I will be spreading darkness instead of light. That's kind of what I'm reading. So Jesus washes their feet. Let's go through it and break it down just a little bit. Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world. There's what was happening. And what's going to happen? He's going to return to his Father. So there's this last discipleship training 101. What can we do as the example? Wash feet. Wow. Many things that could have been done, but that's what Jesus does. Having loved his own who were in the world... We know that Jesus loves those who love Him, of course, but He loves everyone. This gospel is for everyone, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. He washed Judas's feet. Wow. He loved them to the very end. This is the last loving act that he did before he went to the cross getting down and washing their feet all right now think about it too they don't even fathom as you read that you understand you understand that because of peter's reaction because he's bold enough to say it <laughs> they had no idea what he was doing that was beneath him you're the son of god but jesus is saying if i am willing to do this why are you not willing to do whatever is called of you You are the object of God's love. He will get down on his feet and wash, get down on his knees and wash your feet and dry your feet out of lovingness. And don't forget, he'll lay down his life to save you. What is your love response to him? Love can be a noun or a verb, but John uses it as an action verb. It's always love in action. It's if you love Jesus, then you will do this. Verse 2, the evening meal was underway, and the devil was al had already put into the heart of Jesus, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew this. He didn't dismiss Judas. He said, I will wash your feet also. Do you really love Jesus as you proclaim to Unfortunately, there are many, just like in John chapter 6, that want to know Jesus, that want to be associated with Jesus, that will say, I love you, Jesus. But if you love me, you will show it by being obedient to my commands and doing as I have done. And no greater love is there than to lay down your life for your brother. This is exactly what Paul tells Timothy and warns Timothy. If you remember in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting verse 7, we, were, we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot carry anything out of it. So why worry about the things of this world? 
But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires and plunge themselves into ruin and destruction. If you read the other Gospels, you'll know that at the dinner table they argued about who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus showed them, if you want to be the greatest, do like I am doing. This is the example that I give you. Verse 10 of 1 Timothy 6, For the love of money is the roots of all kind of e- root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the confession before many witnesses. Back to first John thir- I mean back to John 13, verse three. Jesus knew the Father had delivered all things into His hand. He could have done whatever He wanted to. All power, all authority in heaven is given to Him. Therefore, make disciples, right? (laughs) Go and preach the gospel message to the ends of the earth, right? So all power and authority is given to Jesus. He can do whatever He wants. He washes their feet. He also knew that he had come from God and was returning to God. So there's an urgency here. What am I going to do? I'm going to wash their feet. Slaves work, the lowest thing to be done. They walked barefoot through the street where the animals roamed. So there was poop on their feet. And Jesus said, I'm doing this because I love you. Verse 4, So he got up from the dinner table, got up from supper, He knew the argument, whether it was before or after. If the argument prompted this, it doesn't matter. He got up from the dinner table. So they're like, what what is he going to do? What's he going to teach? Laid aside his outer garments and wrapped a towel around his waist. Can you hear me? What is Jesus doing next? Is he going to make fishes and loaves? What's he going to do? He's going to wash our feet. What? After this, he poured water into a basin. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe some wine's coming. And what did he do next? He began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel that is around him. I'll say it again. Wow! Wow! I I will read this passage over and over and over again to understand the depths of God's love for me in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life got down on his knees and washed my feet. Not so that I could be clean, because I was already clean, but so that I could continue to be clean to walk this dirty path that I have to walk in this world and proclaim the gospel message. And I need you and I to wash my feet along the way, and I need to wash your feet along the way. So that's why you do have a reading plan. You've got a new reading plan, and it'll take a little more effort. (laughs) It's right here. And you can choose your frosted flakes, or you can choose the reading plan. It requires to read through the Bible in a year about three and a half to four chapters. It requires about 30 minutes. I done told you that you have 33 minutes and 42 seconds if you just pull yourself a bowl of cereal and make a cup of coffee three times a day. It has a devotion for each day. It's outlined there, and it has the reading in in it. And for example, and if you don't know who Alistair Begg is, John, you know, right? Because he's on Moody a lot. He's got a... Scottish English accent, whatever the accent is. He's a very good teacher. He's on Moody. And January 1st is the king of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it tells us why we should worship God is what the first one is. And we're supposed to read Revelation 4 to understand this um, devotional for today. And our reading plan down below that to get through the Bible in a year We read Genesis chapters 1 through 3 and Romans 1 because he also refers to some of the things that are pertinent in his devotional in Romans 1. And if you remember Romans 1 as you study God's Word, and I don't have it in front of me, that's where man has no excuse because we failed to worship God. And as a result, many went into depravity and there was no light at all. What if you procrastinate all the time like Nicodemus and you know that Jesus is the light but you're afraid to admit it, to proclaim with your mouth and believe in your heart and be saved, as Acts says, and you continue in that darkness, is there going to be a point where the darkness overcomes the light and there is no light no more? I don't know. 
I know without the Holy Spirit calling you, you can't be saved. We can get into that topic if we want to. But if God is calling you and you hear His name now, obey. And know that it is more important to feed your spiritual than it ever is to feed your physical. Because guess what? If you go without your Frosted Flakes or your Fruit Loops with marshmallows for X amount of time and you die, but you fed your soul, you will spend eternity with Jesus in heaven as God's child. So why would you not want to read and study God's Word so much more than you want to put food into your bellies? John chapter 6. But many walked away from Jesus that day because that teaching was hard. And Jesus asked the twelve, including Judas, are you going to walk away? But Peter, the one who denies Jesus, who is reinstated at the end, it says, if you love me, feed my sheep. He said, there's no way I can walk away from you, Lord, because you have the words that are eternal life. In fact, you are eternal life. And I'm going to devour them, and they are going to be seen in the way that I live my life, even to death. Verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put it on his outer garments, he reclined with them again and asked, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and rightly so, because I am. All these I am statements. So if your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example, so that you should do as I have done. Truly, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Wow, now not only is this before me that I see what Jesus has done for me, but I will be blessed if I do it. Not just have eternal life, but be blessed that I can experience the peace that surpasses all understanding, that I will be transformed into Christ, that I will know love and can love others, that I will have joy in my heart where I can go around and be merry all the time. And when people see me, they, they may accuse me and everything, but they know something's different about me. And so now I can say my testimony and say it's all because of Jesus. And then it, it's up to them what they do from there. But I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I don't want to make excuses and not be willing to wash feet. I want to be like Jesus in this world. And He has set the example here and says, if I do it on top of that, I will be blessed. Verse 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? Let me state it again. If you love one another. So 2023 is here. It's time for New Year's resolutions and everything else. How are you loving? I've already asked you how you're reading Scripture and if you're willing to take this journey with me, which takes more of a commitment than it did last year. I'm committing to you and you can ask me every day. I'll tell you what my normal is. I normally read those chapters Sunday afternoon so that I can then think about them, study them more through the week. So I do our regular devotions like we did through the week and the readings through the week. And then at whatever point, prepare whatever the message is that I hope the Holy Spirit is leading me to help you think about what you read, to get excited, to go like I've invited you over to my house and Sherry has cooked this meal and I tell you all week, yeah, this is how good it's going to be. Did you, did you understand? Or this is what we just experienced. And did, you, did you know that, that she did this and this and get you excited about it? So that when you read next week's words, you're hungering and you're thirsting for it. So that you've tasted to see that it's good. So I'm going to continue to teach that way, but we'll see how it goes. There's a lot more. I don't know <laughs> if I'll focus on one thing, and I'm not going into these first chapters at first unless God leads me that way. Because I'm going into 1 John first. Because 1 John talks so much about love and expounds upon what we just learned here. And he wrote that afterwards, teaching the church who was falling to laziness, to complacency, to false teachings. 
and they had grown a little cold in their love. Oh yeah, that reminds us of the letters that Jesus wrote in Revelation where you, you have fallen out of love for me. Because see, we need to keep this journey up and keep it up more than we desire eating physical food until the day when we meet Jesus face to face. And we will draw other people along the way that want to be fishers of men. I already gave you the sixth I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You'll follow that, find that in John 14, 6. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. He gives this example. He says, you've got to love me. He says, you know where I'm going. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you believe all this, you are the ones closest to me Judas is gone now. You're, you're, the, you're the ones. Unless you remain in me, you won't produce a crop. We're back to John 12 again. I am the vine. You are the branches. We are intertwined together. Even though I'm in heaven, I'm advocating for you before the Father that you are His. And He will send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will advocate that you are the Father's. And the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will be your comforter, your, your healer. All these things that I'll be gone. So it's even better for you that I go away because God will dwell inside of you. Something, again, that is the craziest concept ever thought of before this. And we take it for granted that God dwells in us so that He'll give you the power, so that He'll guide you all the way through, so that you will be children of light as long as you'll listen to the Spirit. But without me, you will produce no fruit. Do you believe? Then are you a disciple of love? Will you commit in 2023 to become even a better disciple of love, which requires feeding yourself and training yourself more. We spend so much thought on our physical bodies to try to keep us healthy and try to keep us alive when what matters is our spiritual bodies and matters so much more for those who watch us to see if our faith is genuine. You know, your children watching and everything and they hate to see you growing old and die, but they'll be fine when you're gone physically. You need to leave them a life that tells them about the good news of Jesus Christ, a disciple of love. Do you love Jesus? Then will you humbly serve and feed His sheep until He returns? I've got plenty of copies up here of the devotional. If I need to get more, I will get more. Um, if you want your own copy, get it, meaning spouse and spouse. <laughs> husband, wife, whatever. If you want to give a copy to somebody, I don't have a problem with that. Just let me know. And if you can hold off giving a copy, let me make sure that everybody's not here gets a copy. If you want to take a copy, like for Diana or Mark, go ahead and take theirs. If not, I will try to reach them this week and give them to them. Because if they get it next week or the week after, they will already be behind. And that will be one excuse, not that they will use, that I would use. <laughs> In starting, if it's in my hands today, it's in my hands January 1st, and we start January 1st. Oh, yeah, and this is seven days, not, not five days reading, okay? And if you don't want to take the commitment, don't. You can take whatever commitment that you want to, but make sure that you are feeding your spirit. This is the path that I have chosen to let God shepherd me, and through it I will do my best to shepherd you this upcoming year. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the freedom that we do have to come and worship you, the freedom that we do have to read your word whenever we want to, the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in and among us, that we are your priests, that we are your temple, that we are chosen by you, called out of this world to be a child of light, a disciple of love, so that the world may see our love and know your love. Let us not take that lightly, Lord, but let us with great responsibility and fear and trembling take upon us this salvation that has been given to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. All glory and honor be to you for the saving grace that you have bestowed upon us through Jesus Christ. We pray in His precious name. Amen.